The Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics is one of the world's leading institutes for quantum mechanics and study of the cosmos. Gathered together for a conference called Time in Cosmology, quantum physicists, cosmologists, historians, philosophers, all came together to discuss time and how it relates to our universe. During this conference, we had the unique opportunity of interviewing some of the world leading scientists in these fields. And we really hope you like what you see here today. My interest is in the biggest, most abstract, most profound questions about the nature of reality. So that's both fundamental physics, you know, what are the laws of physics, what is the stuff out of which we are made, the particles and forces, and it's also cosmology, it's how does the universe work on very large scales. What happened at the beginning of the universe? Was the Big Bang the beginning or was there something before the Big Bang? Cosmology is presently in a crisis. And the essence of this crisis is a misunderstanding about the nature of time. I've been working on quantum gravity all my life, and time is something that comes over and over into it. To understand quantum gravity, we, un we have to understand how time works. And uh, um, time is an illusion. We all are trying to question the role of time. Why is time always moving forward and never backwards? Isn't this a simple question? Now, what would, if I told you that we don't have an, an answer for that? developed that we're exploring in the conference and also getting responses to and feedback about is a view that cosmology is presently in a crisis and the essence of this crisis is a misunderstanding about the nature of time. brought together people mostly from physics or cosmology, but there's a biologist, there are several philosophers. Roberto Manguevara Unger himself is a philosopher and a social political theorist. So there's a variety of views. We have a historian as well, a historian of physics. So there's a variety of views and backgrounds and that people bring to the question of time. Um, there are widely divergent views about the key issues that we're discussing, which are very old issues. Is time fundamental to the world or is it an essential? Is it, a lay person would say, is it an illusion? I'm João Magueijo, I'm a cosmologist at Imperial College in London. 
and I've worked all my life on basically models of the early universe. So clearly time is important, right? Yeah. Talking about time on a scale, which is the, the age of the universe. So this conference is very challenging in that respect, that's why I came here. Working in science is not like having a political party or having a football team. Or it's, uh, there's nothing wrong with working on different theories, opposite things and very different branches of the same science. And we're basically always, we're just trying to find something new. And although I worked a lot on varying speed of flight theories, there's this other line of research called the axis of evil, which has nothing to do with that. And it merely is the fact that if you look at the sky, uh, particularly in the microwave, so it's not the microwave where you heat up your food, but it's the, this glow of waves which comes from every direction and which is basically a glow of the early universe. If you look at this picture of the early universe, there is a preferred direction. And we call it the axis of evil because it's evil for the traditional assumptions in cosmology, which is the universe should look the same in every direction, and it doesn't. I've always been one who thought that the interaction between philosophy and physics is absolutely crucial, absolutely central. Now, I'm also the first to admit that maybe between 98% and 99% of physics has nothing to do with philosophy whatsoever. If you want to figure out what makes a certain material a superconductor at a certain temperature, or you want to calculate the likelihood that two electrons are going to scatter off of one another, you don't call up a philosopher for help on that. And that is most of what physics is. But some of physics is going to the foundations. What does quantum mechanics really say? What do you mean when you say you have a theory of quantum mechanics? How does quantum mechanics relate to the world around you? What about statistical mechanics? Why is there an arrow of time? Why does entropy increase and so forth? How does the increase of entropy have to do with the fact that I can remember yesterday but not tomorrow, or with my feeling that I have free will for that matter? These are areas where I think clearly philosophy and physics have overlapping interests. And if you're the kind of physicist who cares about those questions, then talking to philosophers is not only useful and helpful, but kind of crucial if you're going to get the right answer. we have the question of the fundamental nature of time, okay? And there's this story called the block universe that has become popular over the course of the 20th century. Einstein contributed to it. It's basically the idea that if you look carefully at the laws of physics, there's nothing special about the present moment, about the now. There's this moment and that moment and some other moment, and you and I, at any one moment of time, are experiencing now, but the laws of physics don't care. They treat all the moments of, of the history of the universe the same. So this block universe point of view says, well, we should just treat the past, present, and future on an equal footing. We shouldn't presume that one is more important or one is different in status than the other. This physics viewpoint is also deeply philosophical in a sense, and it kind of doesn't play nicely with some of our intuitive feelings of the world. For example, the fact that we have a feeling that time flows around us or that we travel through time. If all time exists just as much as any other time, what does it mean to travel through time? How, how is that possible? And physicists are terrible at this kind of question, frankly. Philosophers, historians, and even psychologists and neuroscientists can bring very important perspectives to the table. There is an answer to this question, why even if all moments of time are equally real, you still have the impression of moving through time. And part of it is because in your brain, you carry with you not just the present moment, but you have memories of the moment you just passed through, and you also have predictions for what will happen next. And as those get updated and information flows back and forth from you to the world, you have a feeling of flowing through time. Uh, we just had a brilliant talk here at this conference by uh, Janan Ismail, who's a philosopher. But a philosopher, there's a modern breed of philosophers who know an enormous amount of physics, and they can really help physicists illuminate the foundational questions that they're thinking about. We need 
wanted to bring people from very different fields. So the, the quantum, quantum mechanics from general relativity, from cosmology, which is what I do, I'm a cosmologist. We have philosophers, we have biologists, we have uh, an historian, and they all are bringing their own um, contribution to these key questions. Is time um, really a physical entity or is it an illusion of the human mind and that if I, I could somehow step out of time in, in the universe and, and still see what's going on in time, uh, like as a, as a fool, imagine there was a canvas painted with all the history of the universe and of humanity. So these are all ideas that people are bringing together. They're talking uh, very animatedly. So the question that fascinates me, I want to understand why is time always, we always go towards the future, never the past. And this is really something that a, a child can ask themselves. That's what I find so interesting is that as a scientific community and perimeter is really the pinnacle of, of thought, of, of the theoretical physics uh, thinking, and it's, it's such a privilege that, uh, that we are here. Yes, time, uh, I've been working on quantum gravity all my life and time is something that comes over and over into it. To understand quantum gravity, we are we have to understand how time works. And uh, um, time is an illusion, uh, I, I believe so, but not in the sense that nothing changes. Doesn't mean that now we're blocked here, we don't move anymore. Um, things change in the world. Uh, everything changes, the, the world is becoming. But it's a mistake to think that this becoming is like our usual experience of time, which is a single time, you know, everywhere in Canada, in the universe, in the, it's, uh, now it's, 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 uh, it's sometimes, and then half a minute later, one minute later. This global time is fake, it's apparent. Um, two clocks put one a little bit higher, one a little bit lower, uh, go a different speed. The clock itself, if I'm very, very precise, jump back and forward. So the temporal structure of the world is very different than the time of our experience. The time of our experience it's a cons is, is an approximation, is a construct, it depends on our mind, it depends on a lot of stuff. Uh, to do quantum gravity, we have to forget all that and to describe becoming without a time variable. And in that sense, um, there's no time fundamentally down there in the small. It really strikes me that some of the questions that we're addressing are indeed questions that have been part of our exploration of, of, the, of the world that we find ourselves in since ancient times, since the very beginning of the time of, from which we have actual records of, of human exploration, human intellectual activity. Personally, I find it immensely stimulating and in fact I think the, the most fruitful, stimulating and enjoyable conversation that I've had so far at this meeting has been with one of the philosophers whom I met for the first time here. 
So hearing what she had to say about time and our perception of time was very challenging to me because I think I have a different point of view. So hearing what she had to say and then trying my very best to articulate my own view and to defend it was very helpful, particularly with a philosopher. Well, she was very, very, she's very incisive, very clear, and to try to get my physicist's brain and uh, communication organs into shape, into, you know, as clear and, and precise language as possible to be able to communicate with her was very, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, this is a very international endeavor, so it's obviously a very deep question, which isn't, you know, where did the universe come from? It's not in 100 years, where is it going to be? Is it in billions of years? So it's nothing directly relevant for the life, for the life of, you know, everyone. But, you know, as the theory of relativity showed, uh, things can start very abstract, very um, philosophical. And every time you go to the hospital now, everything is based, all the equipment around you is based on the theory of Special relativity, this camera is based on the theory of special relativity, the phone, everything is using technology which one way or another goes back to something which was initially quite philosophical. Mm -hmm. So there's no telling where things are going to go. And, uh, and that's the point about funding and supporting, asking questions which look like we'll have never any practical application because there's no telling where uh, the next big thing with practical applications is going to come from. We do learn things, right? We actually know a lot more now than we did 20 years ago or certainly 100 years ago. 100 years ago, we knew essentially nothing correct about the universe on large scales. We didn't know there were other galaxies. We didn't know the universe was expanding. We didn't know that it came from a Big Bang. None of that was known. So we take for granted how rapid our understanding has actually been. Now we know an enormous amount about the universe. But like you say, every time we learn something about the universe, that just raises more questions that we'd like to know the answers to. You see, cos cosmology is in a very strange situation. As an observational science, it's in a golden period. There's been dramatic increase in the reach of our observations cosmologically. There's been a dramatic increase in the precision of the observations. And so we have a picture of the universe as it's been the last 14 point something billion years ago. But when we put that into a theoretical model, the model is confusing. It depends on some seemingly arbitrary choices. It is what we call fine-tuned. It's, it's very delicate, it's very brittle. Um, if one, it has some parameters, some numbers in it to describe it, if the numbers were slightly different, the universe would be quite different. It requires that the universe have been extraordinarily special at the earliest moments of time extraordinarily, some people say, improbable. But that's bizarre. That doesn't make any sense because the universe is the one, is only one. It happens once and there's only one universe. So what does it mean to say its original state is improbable or its early state is improbable? So we have a bunch of puzzles and a sense of crisis explaining the universe that the observers have told us we live in. One of the dichotomies that was laid down in those early times, which we're still debating today, is that of being versus becoming. And that's very central to the sorts of debates about time that we're having in this conference. And that dichotomy is between the notion or the concept or the picture of the world as simply existing in a timeless way. It, the world doesn't change, it is essentially fixed and static, it just exists, it is. So that's the being side of the dichotomy. And the becoming side is exemplified by the idea that things are always, there's nothing permanent about the world. Um, the concepts which, which are fundamental to the world are concepts of events and processes and the idea that um, time passes and that there are no enduring substances but, mere, but more the world is better understood as patterns of events. So this debate between these two, these two positions is, con continues today 
and it's part of our conference, part of the things that we're discussing. And different attitudes to this question inform and um, motivate different research programs. So depending on your point of view on these questions, it can lead you, lead us, lead, lead one to, to pursue different sorts of directions in, in fundamental physics. I, I think that's a great uh, aspect of this conference and of Perimeter, because Perimeter is a place where these things can happen. Uh, in the conference there are philosophers, there are biologists, um, there are physicists, there are cosmologists, there are mathematicians, so there's all this uh, mixture of different people. Everybody has looked a different side of the story and of course everybody has its own ideas and think, everybody thinks that everybody else is wrong, obviously. Right? People scream at each other, but in this uh, confusion you get ideas and you learn from somebody else and you say, haha, that works, that might work. And then in these discussions, uh, clarity, I think, slowly emerges. Not on the spot, of course. But if I think back my my past, uh, uh, ideas came from situations like this one, talking with people different from me and giving me new perspective. Uh, and then I jump out from my ideas and learn something else. That's how science works, in my opinion. And we brought together experts who have very different views to debate the questions. And we hope to do so in an atmosphere which is tough, but friendly and constructive, where we can really confront the different views with each other and maybe change some minds and maybe make progress actually on these tough questions. Um, I have learned a lot, more than what I ex would ex expect from philosophers. Um, I didn't expect it so much. Um, there were some philosophers in the, in the, in the conference uh, that uh, said the things which uh, for me was a, a great moment of clarity. Um, one of the things discussed uh, a lot in this conference, a conference about time, is in which sense becoming, changing, um, is already described in, the, in, in our physics. Our physics already described, and some people want to say no, and the philosophers uh, challenge this no and say, wait a moment, when you talk about becoming, you're not talking about anything more than what the physics already described. That was very clarifying for me. It's, it's a new way of thinking and I learned it from, from here. I learned something even from people who are very dif distant from me in the spectrum of uh, approaches to quantum gravity, um, some new ideas. Uh, so, but you know, I think that you realize what we have you have learned in a conversation of, or in a conference, not immediately, later, mm. later. Later on, you think about something and you say, oh yeah, I have this idea, and then where does this idea come from? Oh, it come from because three months ago, I listened to that. So it takes time then to... Having all the voices from every different field speak up and disagree, and also uh, learn tools and ideas from each other. This is never happens in, 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 or very rarely happens in, in science. The quantum gravity uh, community meets together, the cosmology community met, meets together, and we are arguing about details of the theory, and that is an impor important format because that's how science progresses. But really, when we meet, put everybody together in one room with um, a common set of questions, coming from all the different communities. The debate has just been, it's so beautiful. It's, there's so many new div diverse opinions popping up all the time and people changing their minds. Because most of the time you're interacting not so much in the formalized um, environment of giving a talk and people asking questions, but over coffee, over a beer, you know, the, the whole, thing around the conference in a way is more important than the conference itself. And these interactions are very interesting. I mean, certainly I'm meeting people here which well, I'll never, you know, naturally come across, such as philosophers indeed. Um, in fact, we have this allergic reaction. Scientists have this allergic reaction to philosophers and it's ridiculous, it's a sociological thing. So now we're forced to see each other. Now we have breakfast with each other, so we have coffee with each other. And I think you can't reproduce that with Skype. I'm really enjoying it. It's absolutely, it's very stimulating. 
I feel exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I think I haven't had five minutes to, to myself. I just want to talk to, to people constantly. So it's really a good sign when, um, when that happens. It's, it's a format of conference that I, I hope will be copied and, and followed or replicated uh, another a few times because uh, there's a lot of time for discussion. Also, every participant was chosen because they have their own view, so everyone is eager to, to speak. Uh, it was we t carefully chose the room so that uh, every it, it gave like a homely atmosphere, like you're just in your living room, sitting around with your with your friends and everybody raising questions and and so it w the difficult thing was to allocate very little time for speeches, which is main, main, normally the, 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 the largest component, and have lots of time for discussion. And it's such a passionate theme and questions that the, we have not ended on time one single day because everybody just has their contribution. Public-private investment in Perimbra that started some 16 years ago and the investment in the Institute for Quantum Computing that followed has given the Quantum Valley of Canada the opportunity to be one of a handful of global centers that will lead the world into the next quantum industrial revolution. Extremely important to underline just how uh, essential the work being done here is not just for Canada, but for the entire world. Well, seven and a half years ago, I went to see Stephen Hawking, my friend and colleague in Cambridge, UK. I told him I was thinking of leaving for a small town in Canada, where they'd started an institute devoted to quantum theory and space-time. I'll never forget how his eyes lit up. Wow, they get it! And during his recent visit to Perimeter, he surprised me again when he said, Perimeter is now one of the world's leading centers for theoretical physics, if not the leading center. And it's true. This investment will help drive the important work being done here at the Institute and will securely place Canada among the forefront, the kind of cutting edge research uh, that we see and that quite frankly, uh, the world needs. That work and research includes uh, core work into theoretical physics, innovative training programs, and outreach programs designed to get students, teachers, and all Canadians excited about science. So you don't have to be a geek like me to appreciate how important this work is. Although I have to tell you, when we get to the media questions later, I'm really hoping people ask me how quantum computing works. Because, uh, I'm, uh, I'm There are several things that we had in mind at the beginning that were part of the philosophy of the original founders that I believe make Perimeter very different. One of them is an emphasis on foundational fields, on physicists who ask the really deepest, hardest questions, like how to unify space and time with quantum theory, how to understand quantum theory how to study the universe as a whole. Was the Big Bang the first moment of time or was it an event in a sequence of universes or eras of the universe? So we have a special emphasis on fundamental foundational issues. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think there's two great things that Perimeter really excels at. One is simply an enormous concentration of smart people thinking about the same sets of ideas, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very nice. There's, there's a lot of smart people doing physics and cosmology and philosophy for that matter, scattered throughout the world. But maybe the ones who really share ideas at a deep level, there's two or three at any one university. So here at Perimeter, there's a lot of them, and that really in, incubates ideas at a faster pace than you could get if everything is spread out throughout the world. The other is that Perimeter really tries to bring people who don't actually live and work here, but you know they work somewhere else, they want to come here to Perimeter. And when they do that, they often do that in an interdisciplinary way. So it's not just the same people you see at every conference that you go to, you're seeing a different set of people because they sort of angle the groupings a little bit differently than you might be used to. So you ask questions in a different way. At our Time and Cosmology conference, we have physicists and cosmologists, but we also have philosophers and historians and journalists. And it's a great mix of people, all, who have, all of whom had their own perspectives on the questions. Most universities have physics departments that are more pragmatic, that are more about questions that are addressed by experiments in the present period. We can call those sort of mainstream or pragmatic physics. We also have pragmatic physics. We're not just an institute of foundational physics. In fact, the key idea that I think makes Perimeter special is a tension between the pragmatic physicists and the foundational physicists, because we have both and we all have to live together and work together in the same structure, and we're all in it together building this wonderful institute. It is a real hub for fundamental physics and the program, the visitor program here I think is second to none. I think the, the, the sheer numbers of, of researchers who come through and whom one can meet here is, yeah, is extraordinary and that, yeah, that the creativity that's that's produced by the interaction of the people who come here is yeah is it is immense. Um, we also have an emphasis on aiming for discoveries. We're not interested. We do write a lot of research papers, but we're not interested just per se in writing a lot of research papers. We keep a very ambitious goal in mind, which is to make breakthroughs in science. And by that we mean the real thing, an, an idea or a theory which explains or predicts an experiment. The result of the experiment then being available and agreeing with the theory. That's when there's a breakthrough. When there's a new experimental finding and a new theoretical prediction or development which explains it and anticipates it. So they're very rare, and they've been especially rare the last several decades in fundamental physics. So we speak frankly with each other, is this aiming at a discovery? If it's just normal academic problem solving, incrementally advancing somebody's idea of a research program, it cuts it most places, but it doesn't cut it here. So you can sort of measure the total amount of energy in the universe. Energy and mass can be converted into each other through E equals mc squared. Total amount of energy or mass in the universe, 5% of it is what we call ordinary matter. So that includes every planet, star, galaxy, interstellar gas, all that stuff, 5%. Of the rest of the 95%, 25% of the stuff in the universe is what we call dark matter. So it's matter, it's some kind of particle or something like that. It's dark, so it's neither shining nor does it absorb light. It's just transparent, it's really invisible matter, to be honest. But the important thing is it's not atoms. It's not any of the particles we've ever detected here on Earth. The dark matter particle, whatever it is, is new. We've ruled out the possibility that it's anything that we've ever seen directly here on Earth. So searching for the dark matter is a big project in modern physics. And then finally, we have 70% of the energy of the universe, which is what's called dark energy, which is not even matter. It's not even a particle. Dark energy seems to be some kind of energy that exists in every little bit of space, and it's just inherent in space itself. It's the same amount of energy, even as the universe expands, and galaxies and matter and so forth dilute as the universe gets bigger. 
The dark energy does not dilute away. The amount of dark energy in every cubic centimeter of space remains constant, and it provides an impulse that pushes the universe apart. That's how we discovered it. We discovered in 1998 our universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating. We attribute this acceleration to the existence of dark energy in the universe. To me, I, I believe that loop quantum gravity oh, today is the best possible description of quantum gravity. It's not confirmed, uh, it might be wrong, uh, we need experiments. Uh, we're not sure about all that. There are people that think different things. Um, we have to study more, we have to get to the point in which we make an experiment and say, look, this theory is right, this theory is wrong. But in loop quantum gravity, this is what happens. Um, in, we have fundamental equations of loop quantum gravity, and in this fundamental equation there's no time, no space. There is some quanta of, 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 of gravity that sort of dance, dance around one with the other, and the space and time emerge in the, in the, in the when you look things from, it's like a t-shirt, right? If you, if it's, it's, it's a flat thing, but then if you look into small, it's weaved by little things. So this little quanta weave together and make space and time. I still think that is cosmic microwave background, this cosmic radiation, this glow of radiation we see in the sky, and which gives a picture, direct observational picture of the early universe is the most fascinating thing we have in cosmology. Because we can all make theories about the pre-Big Bang before the Big Bang. And, but, and the point is, that if you cannot test them, they're not science. Whereas this cosmic radiation is a tool which allows us to rule out theories, to really advanced knowledge, solid knowledge about the early universe, the first second of the universe, the first microsecond of the universe. So although it was something that was emitted much later on, it carries all these relics from this very early stage. And I think for a long time, uh, cosmology is going to be, the exciting things in cosmology are going to come from this tool, this observational tool, uh, which in a way is better than a time machine. Because we're looking, as we're looking further and further, we're getting signals that took longer and longer to get to us. So we're getting a picture which is earlier and earlier in the universe. So we're basically getting direct access visual access to the past and this is exactly what is going to show whether these speculative theories are correct or they're not. Certainly time is the fourth dimension uh, up to some level of description of the world. It's true in special relativity, it's true in general relativity, it's not false, uh, but when you go down to quantum gravity it's not true anymore. Things are more complicated. In fact there is no continuous time, there's no continuous space. Uh, uh, space is broken up in little quanta of space that sort of jump around independently one from the other and we cannot think of a normal space and normal time. I, I, the first time I came to this institute was the week it opened the doors in 2000 so and it was actually before this building everything was in the in the old post office which was actually a restaurant at the time which had just gone bankrupt. So they rented this restaurant and there were no offices. It was just, um, you went inside and it was just a, a restaurant, right? And I thought it was great for getting people to interact. And, and I love this hippie incarnation of this institute, which is really the beginning. It was really, really off mainstream. And, and I think this conference reflects that. Throughout the years, of course, it's disappeared. And now that we are in a more formalized building, I know it's beautiful, but it's not this hippie commune. It's big, the, commun the, the community really increased in size massively, so of course all that informality was lost as the place grew and became more mainstream. But still it has still echoes of these, these, like, uh, these early days, of this, uh, this peace and love kind of attitude. And I think that's why this conference in a way is happening here. It still, it still goes back to the origins of this institute. Well, I think that most people are intrigued by and interested in the most fundamental questions, including the questions about our origins, about how the universe came to be the way that it is. And cosmology, as you said, is the largest, is the question about the largest scale, scales that we can, that we can see out to. The purview of science is continually growing and it's beautifully mirrored by our understanding of the world as 
being a universe which is expanding. So horizons in terms of our understanding are expanding and that it, it's some, there's something very satisfying in the notion that the universe itself is also expanding as mirroring or echoing or resonance between the way we find the world to be and our, our success in science as being something progressive and something that is bringing more and more of the world into the range that we can understand and explain. That's, yeah, I think that's very satisfying to many people. It's one of the things that, that motivates and drives um, many of my colleagues who are here at this meeting. It's very important to question everything as a rule number one. So we, for a living, what we do is basically open up textbooks and say this is wrong. Just for the, for the sake of it, because there's no way of finding out uh, something beyond established knowledge without questioning the established knowledge. So the kind of process we, we make is basically propose theories which are new and then throw them away if they don't work. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, mm -hmm. there's nothing that says, oh, I've lost, I've wasted a year. No, it's just part of the game. And if out of 100, one, one of these things works, it's great. Uh, and that's the game we play. A third thing is an emphasis on empowering young people. We hire postdocs, but unlike postdocs are people just out of the graduate school who just earned their PhD. Most universities hire postdocs to help faculty members do their own research. So they're helpers. And they're hired and promoted or retained on their ability to help somebody else's research program. We hire postdocs not to help members of the faculty, but who we see as young people who are trying to make breakthroughs of their own. We ask, is this person a nascent leader? Do they have what we think it takes to make a breakthrough on their own, not by assisting somebody else's research program? So we have unbelievably good and ambitious young scientists in the building. Very simply, normal computers work uh, <laughs> by... Uh, no, no, don't, don't interrupt me. When you walk out of here, you will know more. No, some of you will know far less about quantum computing, but most of you, normal computers work uh, either there's power going through a wire or not. It's one or a zero. They're binary systems. Uh, what quantum states allow for is much more complex information to be encoded into a single bit. Regular computer bit is either a one or a zero, on or off. A quantum state can be much more complex than that because, as we know, uh, things can be both particle and wave at the same time, and the uncertainty around quantum uh, states uh, allows us to encode more information into a much uh, smaller computer. So uh, that's what's exciting about quantum computing, and that's what we're The world seems to flow moment to moment to moment to moment. The world as it appears to our perception is a world in which everything is in a moment of time, which is one of a succession of moments of time. But is that the way reality is? Is reality a moment of time in a succession of moments of time? Or is that a kind of construction or illusion constructed by our brains for some purposes of being more fit biologically. Gather together for a conference called Time in Cosmology. Quantum physicists, historians, and philosophers all came together to answer age-old questions. Questions like, why is time always moving forward? What's the difference between being versus becoming? What struck me the most when interacting with these great minds was their ability to deal with dissenting views. 
Because they do research at the quantum level, and they cannot see with their own eyes what they're researching, they're constantly questioning their understanding of reality. We hope these discussions help shed light on how we fit into the cosmos. Look, there is a wrong image of a scientist. The scientist is somebody who is certain about something, has proven something, is scientifically proven, and science is acquired certainty. That's nothing as wrong as that. A scientist is somebody who works at the boundary of what we know, what we don't know, so keep changing ideas, is wrong all the time, and is ready to question its own ideas. That's what science is about. It's about doubt, it's not about certainty. And if you keep doubting, then you revise your idea, and so you get better and better description of the world. That's how science uh, works, in my opinion. One of the speakers this morning saying, uh, knowledge is power. And then he goes to the board, draws, a, scratches the word, ignorance is power. This is what we are looking for in science, is for someone to shock us and, and perplex us. And what do you mean? I've never heard that. Gosh, that's interesting. Let's see what you mean by that. It's completely shocking to me against my beliefs, that is science. That to me has come out of the work that we did with Roberto and Marina is the possibility that the future is open as a human being, if we're talking just about as a human being, as well as as a scientist. Um, physicists are used to this mechanical picture of nature according to which the laws of nature are strictly deterministic and the future is just a rearrangement of the present. The, you have particles moving around, atoms and molecules, they obey the laws of physics. They interact via chemistry which is derived from the laws of physics. And given that you knew the state of the world at one time, the state of the world at all future times would be predictable. There's a lot wrong with this view, not to mention that it doesn't take into account quantum mechanics, which is probabilistic and not deterministic. But this still has tended to be the dominant view. And so, as Roberto says, not only is this a universe of change, but change changes and in ways that allow the future to be at least a little bit open. And we also take seriously that the present is real. Einstein and, other, and some philosophers and some physicists said that the whole universe is laid out in a frozen eternity. Past, present, and future are all equally present all the time. And a view where the past, present, and future are objectively different is hard to wrap your mind around if you're used to the other thing. But 
changes the situation or how at least I feel about being a human being alive in the universe. It makes me more responsible. It makes agency and will real, starkly real. Um, and this makes the choices and the contingency of human life um, stand out more against the background. And this has changed my life. Now this has nothing to do with the work in the fundamental physics. And even if something is a story that you like personally, that's not evidence in science. We don't get the universe that we want. But, um, but nonetheless, it's been kind of liberating. And it offers liberating possibilities for the solutions of a number of scientific problems as well. General Relativity offers people a really revolutionary new view of the physical world. And because it does so, that definitely affects the way we think about ourselves as human beings in the world. And the, the revolutionary aspect of general relativity is that it does away with the concept of the world as being three-dimensional space with objects in it and with time passing for those objects. That view of the world has been replaced by a different view of the world in which the world is a history. Physical reality doesn't consist of just a configuration of particles in space with time passing. What I am is my entire past. That, that is me. That's what general relativity teaches us. The world, the, the physical world, is not a thing that just exists at this moment of now with time passing. It's actually, it is its history that has actually affected my my psychology, the way that I think about myself, the way that I think about my, my life, the way that I think about the reasons I do what I do. And I think it affects the way that I interact with other people as well, because if you meet someone and you think, what is this person that I'm meeting? You are your history. So in order, if I were to say, how can I understand you? How can I understand what you are and who you are? Then. To fully do that, I need to know your history. I need to know how you got to be here, what all the events in your past. That is what you are. And that's what general relativity actually, it says that. And it, it's, I think that's amazing because general relativity is our best understanding of space and time. It's our best understanding of, of the way the physical world is. And it tells, it, this is the lesson it teaches, that to understand something, you need to know its history. That, that entity is a history. So you are your history, you are your past. Um, I think that, uh, once again, there is a too narrow view of science. That science, it's rational, it's cold, it's a negation of uh, um, what we perceive as emotion of our spiritual life, uh, our collective life, love, beauty, all, 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 all these things. Um, I think that's deeply wrong. Precisely because we humans are natural beings, I think, in a natural world, and natural creatures in a natural world. But we are complex, extraordinarily complex. Um, and uh, these emotions, this, that things that we perceive our spiritual lives uh, are not in contradiction with physics or chemistry. They are a complicated aspect or a very complicated nature, part of which we have figured it out and part we haven't. One of the things we have not figured it out well, we, have not understand, we don't understand well, is ourselves, right? How we, our brain work, how we have emotions. So there is, science doesn't close room to our emotional and also, I would say, spiritual life, in, in a sense, as you would say. Um, what science does, and this is where sometimes the conflict comes in uh, with uh, some religions, not all religions, mm -hmm. is, um, I think, from the other side. So I think that some religions have uh, a little bit threatened 
by this uh, questioning everything of science. So a scientist tends to, de tends to say, well, I'm not sure. How, how do you know that? I, don't, I doubt it. And some religions, not all, again, I want to make a distinction. Some religions say, oh, 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 that's, that's not good. Questioning, you shouldn't question that. You shouldn't ask those questions. You shouldn't. Uh, so certainly there is a conflict. Sometimes it comes within, between some religion and some science, but the conflict is not because science is certain and doesn't allow for other things, because some, some religions want to be certain and are afraid of doubt. It's a crazy thing because our sensation of passage of time, that there's a moment we live in the now, we remember the past, we don't remember the future. Uh, we can affect the future, we cannot affect the past. So this psychological uh, and human experience of time is sadly not present in fundamental physics. So since Einstein proposed relativity, the fundamental object is not one point moving forward in time, it's this line in space-time. So the, the things which you just mentioned, which are our most immediate, most direct experience of time, is totally absent from fundamental physics. And in fact, we think that our sensation of time is in fact to do with the makings of our brain and with things like the, the entropy in our brain, the way the neurological processes work. And I think this is the problem. There's this big tension between human experience and physics. And physics has to be right in some sense because we use it to put rockets, launch rockets and put them in space. We use theories which have this property that time flowing is absent. So how do you conciliate these two things? And this is the reason why we end up with philosophers, biologists, physicists, and we're all shouting at each other, and we don't understand each other. And this is why it's cool to have a conference like this one. I, I am a fan of the author, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan had a way of telling stories in a sense that he was very, very precise in his uh, scientific language and the scientific detail of the story was very beautiful. He had a very consistent theory also or a story um, at the scientific level for how would the contact with other civilizations and how would it go in terms of development. And I was, I was 16 years old and I, I was a dancer in a, in a dance school. I spent eight hours a day dancing. And for me, just, you know, my ideas started questioning and uh, how you would be able to send signals to other civilizations that are uh, very far away just by transmission of light. How do you send uh, a message and a dictionary and then you, after you've given the dictionary, you can even write a book and send to other civilizations all by uh, radio waves. That, that to me was very beautiful. Um, but also he interweaves in the science this personal narrative and the, the very vivid story of, of the heroine. Um, I think she's called Ellie. Her father had died and um, she was uh, had a stepfather. She didn't really like him. She grew up with him and that was a kind of a personal uh, tragedy because she missed her father very much. At the end of the book she finds out that her stepfather that raised her and had all these experiences with her is actually her father. And Carl Sagan connects this with the questioning of our very deep convictions. We need to be aware when we do science of our personal beliefs. And it, it, this, he gave this in a, such a personal and vivid experience for this heroine that really misses her father throughout the entire book. She finds out that her deep, deep uh, beliefs and tragedy were actually not true because the person that she didn't uh, identify so much with was actually her father. As a scientist, this is really very deeply the core of, of science, is, is that we need to be so honest and so open to always identify what is it that is biasing. What is it that is biasing 
myself when I defend this theory instead of another. We're not perfect. A lot of the times we have very deep convictions that are not very clear. And so it's very fresh to have an example of you really believed that this so deeply it was so important, but it turned out it wasn't true. And so that's a lesson as a scientist, but also, and the novelty also in Carl Sagan is that he brings together personal experience with his account of what it is to make contact with other civilizations and how it would all uh, unravel. It was, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful t story. Academics love to say, but that's wrong, that could be said better, I, that's completely ridiculous, how could you possibly say that, that result must, must be wrong. One of the things we said to people at this meeting is to hold back a little bit, criticize, say, I think that's incorrect, I think you've made a mistake, but I'm going to try to add something to your thought. Like in theater improvisation, you're taught not to say no, but always to say yes and I add something. And we tried to play a game. I don't know how successful we were, but trying to encourage people to literally listen to each other and not just talk past each other. Because everybody in the room has written books and papers or books or papers on relevant subjects. And, you know, we're, we're like little robotic science dolls. You turn the switch on and we go, and according to my latest paper, omega is 1 minus 4.2, you know. And it's so easy to get academics to do their standard spiel, which is, of course, what their professional reputation is based on. So getting people to park that stuff at the door and open up and say, okay, now we're going to talk about the important ideas and issues and we're going to try to actually communicate with each other. So that's what we're trying to do in there. And I, I think time will tell if we succeeded. But the atmosphere is extraordinarily vibrant and electric, different from most academic conferences. So I suspect we're doing something interesting. Yeah, I just actually came out with a new book called The Big Picture, and the subtitle was On the Origins of Life, Meaning, and the Universe Itself. One of the criticisms that I get is, what do I know about the universe, about life and you know, meaning and things like that? And of course, I don't pretend to be an expert. I'm not coming in as a physicist and telling biologists or neuroscientists or philosophers how to do their jobs. But it's all one universe, right? Mm -hmm these silos that we put things in, when we sort of intellectually divide up the world in different kinds of questions, the world isn't divided up. We're doing that dividing. The actual questions overlap. Physics has something to say to biology and vice versa, and likewise to philosophy and how we think about consciousness and so forth. So I think that it's crucially important that we all talk to each other in a different way, and we have different cares about how quickly we're going to make progress. Making batteries 20% more efficient is not something I would be any good at, but I'm glad someone is trying to do it, right? The things that we care about, the philosophers, the physicists, and so forth, are the deepest and most foundational questions. It's really driven by pure human curiosity. How does the world actually work? It's not driven by making the world a better place, but guess what? When we answer these questions, it really helps if we want to make the world a better place. One can get into a rut with colleagues and a whole community who have all been raised in the same way. So we've all endured very similar educations in, in my community of theoretical physicists. We all do similar courses, we all read the same textbooks, and it can mean that it's hard for us to break out of certain, certain um, ways of thinking, certain ruts. So so interacting with people who come from different disciplines, who have different ways of thinking, is, for me, I find that immensely useful. Well, it's a bit like art. Is art important for society? I mean, it's this kind of thing which isn't directly useful, but it makes society valuable. So there's this thing, you know, what's the point of... Um, 
you know, once Fermi actually, I think it was, I'm not sure who did, we had this problem, to face this big panel of politicians trying to explain why this accelerator um, mm -hmm. was going to be built, why are going to put so much money into this? And, and of course, it was his general, this was in the US, who asked, so in what sense is this accelerator of particles going to help the defense of the United States of America? And the guys just replied, it's going to help making the United States of America worth defending. And sometimes things are not directly practical, but they increase the value of quality of life, everything about the country. And it's um, so a bit like art, a bit like theater, a bit like anything else. Some pure science has this property. And it actually has a value, adds value to society, even if it doesn't directly um, produce technology. Is, is seven brief lessons of physics. Very, it's a small book, it's very, um, and uh, it has become a bestseller. In fact, in America, in England, in China, in Italy, it's translated in 39 languages right now. To my total surprise, um, it's short, and uh, the idea I go to the core of quantum mechanics, general relativity, cosmology, particle physics, uh, uh, quantum gravity, and then also I talk about what we are as human beings in the physical world. And um, people like it, I'm very happy. You see that not only do the physicists and, and philosophers in the room disagree about some things, uh, not physicists disagreeing with philosophers, but physicists disagreeing with each other, philosophers disagreeing with each other, but they do sort of line up into camps. like. If you think a certain thing about the fundamental nature of quantum mechanics, you'll probably think this other thing about the fundamental nature of consciousness. And even though they have nominally nothing to do with each other. And I think a lot of it has to do with how comfortable you are with separating our most abstract, deep, underlying way of talking about the world with how we think about our everyday experience of the world, our intuition, right? We all know that the deep, discoveries that are made by physics talk about a world that is very different than our everyday experience, right? Quantum mechanics, relativity, the Big Bang, and in biology and psychology, the same thing. Evolution, Darwinian evolution is not part of your everyday experience either. So how willing are you to totally give up on your everyday experience and try to sort of say the world is a very, very different way and then build bridges between that very, very different foundational world and the world you see versus trying to say like, look, I just see the world, it is this way, that better be part of the fundamental nature of reality. And we don't know how far to go in this, in this process. How different is the fundamental nature of reality allowed to be from our immediate phenomenological view of the world? So that's why it's good to have a dialogue about these things. The good thing is that because science is based on data and observation and experiment, eventually you get better at it. You do in fact discover new things about the world and the disagreements go away and they're replaced by new disagreements that our successors will eventually be arguing about. is a piece of music written by uh, Ligeti. Ligeti is, one of, is, is considered by many perhaps the greatest, one of the greatest musicians uh, um, of the second half of the last century, so contemporary musicians. It's a classical music by the strange things that musicians <laughs> started to do in the 60s. Uh, uh, in, in that period, I think it's middle of the season, 63. Um, the first time it was performed publicly in the, it, it, it was supposed to be performed at the uh, Dutch television, mm -hmm. so it was recorded and before showing some director of Dutch television saw it and said no, 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 and replaced with a soccer game because it was too shocking. This. <laughs> I think one has to, um, first it, it's great to uh, listen to it live, but one has to listen carefully and see how these sounds keep changing, changing, changing un uh, until the end. And then one starts perceiving this emotion of the slowly stopping of all the reeds one by one. And it's a very strange piece of music, it's very simple. There are a hundred metronomes 
uh, that they start more or less all together, but each one goes a different, uh, a different. Uh. So all you see all these things moving, and you hear this noise, <laughs> all these sounds, strange sound together. But then that's where it starts becoming interesting. Um, some of them stops because the they lose their, 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 their charge, so one by one slowly become to stop. So the sounds start changing, and from this sort of like wind or, or like rain, uh, the, the noise become more rarefied, less and less. So the tension grows, and at some point there are only three, then two, and then one. That's, that's, you, you, you wait for the end, and it's like death coming. It's, I feel it enormously emotional listening to these things, even if it is every time is different from any other time, right? Because it's, it's, it's governed by, by chance how these things uh, move. But it's a fantastic piece of music. And uh, I've heard it three or four times, and each time it's more emotional to listen to this noise. Mmm.